I, I was serious when I started uh, this, this short series on biblical manhood about wanting to start a movement. And I'm really, I'm really praying that God will set our hearts on fire. Um, some, some of these younger guys that God's brought to the road here have really been encouraging me, uh, you know, some of them for a while and some of the newer ones. We, we, I, I had lunch with, I, I hate to mention his name, I'll probably have to edit this out of the video, but um, Roland, who guy that y'all met, I guess, at the gym and brought up here, me and Cameron had lunch with him, and he told us about his conversion, and I was like, oh, wow, it was just exciting to hear, and um, I just want to see more and more of that. And I think it's kind of dumb to assume we'll see more and more of it if, we, if we're not going to be used to reach people. You know, it was, it was a, uh, a uh, high school coach who also served in some capacity on staff who reached out to him, invited him to church, and then clarified the gospel with him. And so God uses people. So I'm hoping one of the things that God does is sets our hearts on fire to see the salvation of others. Um, and I, I'm, I've been convicted that um, my heart, I, I'll confess it myself, but I think all of us too, to a degree, um, we just need a, an awakening. I just believe it's time for an awakening. And we've seen those in history, and I, I just want to start begging God to do it here. And and guys, what I, should that start with our women? I mean, I want to see God work mightily in the lives of our ladies too. This is this is not a. I try to be very clear. This is not a biblical manhood. Does not mean anti womanhood. No, 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 no. Um, this is just biblical, godly manhood. And um, here, here in the states, we see the same thing when we go to Ecuador with the church people there. The men are lazy spiritually. It's the women serving. It's the women motivated for Christ. And the guys are just tied up with other things. Well, today I want to talk about uh, the call on a man's life to work. Biblical manhood and work. Uh, this is... Uh, this subject is far more important to us as Christians than we might at first think. Honestly, all of our life we're going to be working. Even our times with our families we spend working. Even, our, even in our families, loving our families is a kind of work that God's called us to. We'll talk about that next Sunday. But, you know, if you work 40 hours a week at a job, for 40 years, that's going to be 83,000 hours of your life spent working, spent doing whatever it is God's called you to do to make a living and work in this world. So uh, the majority, probably, of our waking hours will be spent working. And so... I mean, you know, is there one part of our lives, if you're, if you're truly a believer, is there one part of your life that doesn't belong to Christ, that shouldn't belong to Him, that shouldn't be affected by your faith? No, our faith should be completely infused throughout all we think or do. Your job, your work, whatever you do, whatever you do, your faith should be a major part of it. And one of the great successes of Satan in our culture, and this has been probably even before my lifetime started, but one of the great successes is, okay, listen, okay, you can be a Christian if you want, but don't, you know, don't bring that to school. Don't talk about Jesus at work. You know, don't, you know, let's keep those parts of our lives. Keep your faith. Keep it private. Keep that over here in a compartment and your work in a compartment and your family. And so we divide all these things up to the point where Jesus gets to be something that happens and we squeeze in on a, for an hour and a half on Sunday morning. And brothers, that just is not right. <laughs> That's not the way God has designed it to be. 
Every hour of every day belongs to Christ. We've been bought with the blood of Christ. That means all that I am, all that I have belongs to Him. Everything I am and have, I should be stewarding for His glory. And so we want to think specifically about our works. Now, I think there's probably, and man, the, some of the things I'm going to share with you, I, I, I wish there had been somebody there. Ethan, Caleb Logan, when I was uh, going into my teenage years, I wish somebody would have been there explaining what I'm about to explain to y'all. Because um, here's what, I, I, went, I, I went to a Christian school. Um, one of I had some godly Christian teachers who were great, that good Christians, loving people. I'm so thankful that God used them in my lives. And yet I don't think they had a robust biblical theology about work. So I have a Christian teacher. Teacher, why, why, why? I'm 15 years old. Like, I would rather spend my time literally reading my Bible than doing geometry or algebra. Why am I doing algebra? Why am I doing language? Why am I doing history? Well, so you can, you need to do a good job on this stuff so you can go to college. Why do I need to go to college? You need to go to college so you can make a lot of money. That motivated me zero. Now, Money obviously motivates a lot of people, <laughs> so they'll do real good in school and real good in college. But you know, money might be an idol. But but where is the? Where was the? Listen, God's got a call on your life. The majority of your waking hours as a Christian is going to be lived out in the context of a career a field of work that you and that is going to be your call to serve God to glorify God your work needs to be an act of worship that would have read, and I know everybody's not like I was then and it was a unique thing of God's grace in my life but we need to be connecting our work to our faith and to God's glory there's there's sort of two extremes for men and work. One extreme is we view work as a necessary evil. Do you know what I mean by that when I say we view work as a necessary evil? It's like we hate work, but we have to do it so that we can get, you know, because we need, well, we need to, we need a place to live. It's funny, I wasn't motivated by money as a 15 or 16 or 18 year old. But you become an adult and you realize you need it. <laughs> you're you're going to need to earn a living to care for your family and support yourself. Um, so we view work as a necessary evil. I, I don't like this, but I do it because I need other things. That's one mistake. Another um, mistake or another extreme that's also not biblical or healthy is... Work becomes to a man their identity, an idol. They, do, they, get, they derive their value, their sense of worth from it. And it could be the position. Uh, it could be the amount of income. It could be, and all kind of different personalities are different. So doing a really good job. Um, so you, you, and um, having a good job, doing a good job at your job is a good thing. A good job, a good career, a career can be a great thing, but it makes a horrible God. It's not a good idol. What I want to do for a few minutes, and I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a lot of teaching this morning, but I'll invite some feedback along the way <coughs> to get you to help me with a few things along the way. I would like to think for a few minutes scripturally about um, our work through the lens of the gospel. One way, there's different ways you could summarize the gospel or think of the gospel. But uh, one way is you could think of the gospel in terms of <coughs> creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. 
Okay, creation, God created things. The fall, sin came into the world. Redemption, Jesus came in the world and died in the place of sin to save people. And then restoration, the, the final um, renewal of all things, where everything is headed. So let, let's, take, let's take those four movements and think about them because this is going to really help us with work. Let's, think, let's start with thinking about creation. You know, in the opening sentence of the Bible, we learn that God works. The first thing we learn about God is that He works. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Right? In over six days, God demonstrates His divine, glorious genius, his creativity in, in all that he makes, um, you know, from the farthest galaxy down to the little microbes and the cells and the subatomic particles that make up matter. All creation glorifies God just by existing, which is one of the evidence that our work should glorify God. Right, because we exist, because he created us and all other things. Um, and we, we should really stand in awe. We should stand in awe of God over the things that he has done, his work. Um, Psalm 33, verse 8, says, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him, for he spoke and he came to be, he commanded, and it stood firm. We should stand in awe of God when we see all that he has done. Now, here's something else I want you to think about. God takes delight in his work. Have you ever stopped to think about this? It's, it's not a, God never viewed work as a necessary evil. He delights in his work. How do we know that? How, how do you think we might know that? Throughout the first three chapters of Genesis, God, after creating, says, and it was good. Yeah, he's taken pleasure in, in what his hands have made. Um, you come to the end of Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good, and there was the evening, and there was the morning, the sixth of the day. Chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. Um, I, that, that was a... <clears throat> I mean, it sounds so obvious God works. Okay, well, we know God works. We know God created everything. We know God s sustains things in His power. But the thought about God being a worker who delights in the work of His hands. Now, you translate this down to the doctrine of the, I'm going to use a Latin phrase, but I want you to learn this Latin phrase, the imago Dei. Who knows what that is? Yeah, it's the doctrine of being created in the image of God. We are created in God's image. And, and one of the things that that means is he's given us the ability to work, a desire to work. He's given us things like creativity and all these things. So um, being created in his image, and even the they call it the creation mandate um, to... Being created in his image, we're supposed to be fruitful and multiply and do what? Subdue the earth and have dominion over it. And so in the creation sequence, what happens next? You, you think about very next things that happens right after in Genesis chapter 2. God planted a garden. And then he planted... Adam in it. Put Adam to work. Put Adam to work. Put, can you pull that verse up? Can you put your finger on that, that passage? The Lord God took a man and 
Put him in the Garden of Eden to work and keep it. Put him in the Garden to work and keep it. And um, there's, there's so many lessons here. Number one, I want you to think of this fact. What has not come into the, to the world yet? Sin. 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 Work comes before sin. Work is not, uh, paradise did not mean laying around in a hammock under a fan, eating grapes and fruit, you know. Um, work was a gift of God before the fall. And to keep it, um, he puts them in a garden. And God, you know, God planted, the Garden of Eden was not a creation of Adam's. God plants this garden, and he, he's in essence saying, listen, I want you to take the rest of the created order and cultivate it. Make it into a garden like this. Now, some writers, and I like this perspective too, when you think about it, um, you could kind of think of all work, in a sense, as a garden, gardening or farming. Um, now, some of you guys, you're, kind of, you're in agriculture, and it's we don't have to work too hard, but taking the raw materials of the earth, managing them, cultivating them, bringing order out of chaos, bringing good, usable things out of these raw materials. But so that, that might make sense when it's when you do it with farming, but you know, a physician, uh, a physician, a musician takes uh, Adam takes these raw um, musical notes and brings order out of chaos with them. Sometimes. <laughs> Every once in a while it might be the opposite. <laughs> if you hear me making if you hear me make music, it's usually in, in reverse. It's usually I'm usually taking order to make it sound chaotic. But um, you know when when someone takes uh, when a seamstress takes clothes like that denim jacket started out as raw materials somewhere probably some cotton that you know bark what's that that might have started right in the field right by my house you know and and people have taken those things and brought usable made usable products out of it um or, or whether it's um you know automobile manufacturers um, harnessing raw metals, um, synthetic things that come from products of the earth, harnessing electricity, electronics, taking, cultivating from the earth these things that, that enrich and help, help our lives. So, um, and you think about that. Next week, I'm going to talk about um, our work, our responsibilities, and our families. And you think about you think about your job as a husband and a father, maybe a grandfather, um, or your future. One day, uh, Lord willing, some of you guys will be husbands and fathers. That God's called us called us to cultivate in that context, to work to cultivate godliness, work to cultivate spiritual fruit in the lives of our wives and our children. Right. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Well, I think um, s some people, there might be several good things we can say about that, or helpful things we can say. Um, a lot of people, and I think this is a good way to look at it, look at it as a covenant, a covenantal structure. Uh, this is a covenant God made with, with Adam. If you obey me and you will live, disobey me, you will die. And I love what it says there. He gave them every tree of the garden there for them to eat. 
God didn't put them in a garden with a thousand trees and say, hey, 999 you can't eat out of, but I'll give you one to eat of. So you're, you're surrounded by all this temptation. No, he's saying, I will, be your, I will be with you. I will be your God. You will live with me here. You will serve me here. I'm just giving you this one command to, to, for you to show that you trust me, that you depend me, depend upon me. You know, this is what it means to be in a relationship with me. And the day that you eat of, and of course, they didn't physically die. They died spiritually. And God still had mercy on it. Does that help answer the question at, at all? Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think these, this is the stipulation I'm giving you to show that you depend on me, that you trust in me. That you that you are you belong to me, um, but that's this leads. Thank you, Adam, because this leads us to the second. You know, number one is creation. Number two is the fall. And when when we talk about the fall, um, we're talking about falling from that state, fall from the state of innocence, fall from that state of relationship with God. Um, falling into sin, plunging the world. So when we say the the fall, when mel when mankind fell from their position that they enjoyed with God, before sin came into the world, some of you are all there in Genesis two. Or if we look at Genesis three, this continuing story, what happens in regards to work because of the fall? Some. Somebody find those verses and read them to us. Okay, what, what chapter? Uh, chapter, three. chapter 3, verse 17. Sure. He said to Adam, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree for which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. <laughs> the ground because of you, and pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. Out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. <sighs> uh, truer. <laughs> Bart's like, can I get a witness? <laughs> That's right. Well, and, and I mean, you're a farmer. You farm mostly a lot of uh, cotton, some peanuts, and maybe some other things, and but you're you're in this whole your whole career is based on trying to find remedies basically against thorns, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you're involved in some of that kind of stuff too uh, in the in the in the work you do and in your education that you're trying to get right now, and of course it had um, when mankind sin, it didn't just. Mankind didn't just die spiritually to God, it plunged the entire created order under a curse. Everything is under a curse. Nothing works like it should. We don't get the full potential of the ground. Um, it's, I mean, listen, this is, the ground's cursed. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles. It's going to produce. <laughs> I'm sure it's one of the. No, it's one of the. Yeah, I mean, it's why there's cancer. Yeah, I mean, literally indigestion, cancer, disease, natural, natural evil, moral evil, all comes through. I was um, I was talking to um, Ethan this morning. He got in my truck, and there's some uh. I got some acorns. Uh, we got some kind of oak tree there at Turner's. Puts off these great big old fat acorns. And it's in the shell almost completely encases the nut. And um, the first time I taught um, uh, church planting and missions in Ecuador, I took some of those out there. And I'm getting ready to go back in February to teach that. And anyway, I heard an illustration one time. Um, Inside of one acorn is the potential for a million trees. And every one of those trees could, in a lifetime, millions of acorns. I mean, 
a whole world of oak trees inside put the potential inside of one acorn and you know this is the same thing with sin you look at that very first sin really unpacked the whole every sin every fruit of the curse flowed out of that first sin and so that means what are some other let's think it's real easy with farming because it's literal but do we have thorns and thistles, more of a like a metaphorical nature in all the rest of our work? Like, do you ever have problems on your job? What are some other kind of problems that we face in our work that are the result of the fall? Coworkers. Coworkers. Yeah. 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 Scott, go ahead. Even in teaching. <laughs> Most teachers, people who want to teach, go into it because they like sharing knowledge. They like mentoring people, being with others. Um, but then all these mandates and everybody else involved takes all that stuff away from it. We've got. Something drawn up in Washington doesn't even relate to your children. So, yeah, every business, every career. Take that principle you just said. This this is a great illustration of the curse in our work. They get these mandates as a means to try to help. They're trying to help, but it makes it worse, you know. The same thing in nursing. I mean, some of the things that they, Cole was telling me about a case uh, he had, and they got they have some pr policies and legal procedures in place that are meant to help, but in reality, it's not helping. It's just kind of the nature of the world we live in now, the fall. Even to try to to try to reduce the effects of the fall, the things we do to try to help. It might help, like in this area, a little bit more, but it's hurting in another area. Or, or, I mean, just like, I'll give you an example. Let's say, you know, at Turner's Furniture, our, the job is to sell and deliver really good quality furniture to people. So, but to really, really do a really good job of that consistently is going to mean, um, and I tell this to people, it's going to mean the blood, sweat, and tears of our employees. Like, to get some of those sofas through a front door without tearing the front door up, you've about got to tear your knuckles up to do it, you know. Um, I, I, within the past year, I had to go out on a delivery day. And I, I used to do this more, but I'm getting older, and I... It, Carrying those power sofas ain't no joke, y'all. I grabbed a power sofa up underneath, and when you get to the a, like a standard front door, you got to turn. There's a certain angle you got to turn it all in to make it go in. And I grabbed that thing, and I grabbed that thing, and I reached underneath there, and I grabbed something and cut my finger. And immediately I could tell I was bleeding. And and so what am I doing now? I'm trying not to drop the sofa, and I'm trying not to bleed on this man's floor. Like literally, you know, I mean, it's just, um, so, so, but, but, well, I could have dropped a sofa and seen about my cut, but then I could have damaged his floor, could have damaged the sofa, could have caused him a headache. You know, we're going to have to re-deliver this another time. Um, but there I was hurt <laughs> over trying to do a good job for this guy. And, and I mean, so that's where, um, You'll see a lot of complaining if you work with people, and I'm gonna, I, I, I might want to. This really would come under the other heading better, but I want to talk about it now. Okay. 
if you know Jesus, if you really know Jesus, you might be tempted to complain sometimes, but we should not be complainers. Let's, let's transition on this point, because I, I want you to see this. Um, you know, creation, all right, there were no problems. God gave work. It was good. God delights in his work. He gave us work to delight. Work It was meant to something that helps us at flourish and help other humans flourish the fall comes in it's all spoiled now right now it's everything's going to be by the you're going to eat bread by in pain all the days of your life it's going to be thorns and thistles everywhere you turn problems headaches disappointment hardship well christ didn't leave us in this fallen world in this mess to be left this way. He came to redeem us from the curse of the fall. Um, there's a great place in John chapter 17, and I, I didn't, I didn't, you know, I could, we could have taken 10 years to pour over every verse of John 17, and, and we would have been justified in doing that, but it, it might have killed us all. But there's this one, one of the verses that I didn't focus on while I was there. Jesus said to the Father, Lord, I have completed the work that you gave me to do. He came. Jesus came to undo the curse, to reverse the curse. Somebody turn to Galatians chapter 3 and please read verses 17 and 19. No, no, let's hold on. Where, where, let me find this. Galatians 4, uh, and read verses 4 and 5, please. Good. And I have Galatians 3.13 in my notes. It says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs, who is hanged on a tree. Now, <clears throat> I want you all to see this. Um, I, I, I hope what I'm about to say gives you a whole new perspective on whatever the work is God has called you to. Um, the, the thorns and the thistles came in because as the result of our sin, our sin in Adam. And Jesus comes, and what does he get? He got the crown of thorns. He's pierced with the thorns that were the result of our sin. And all of this as, as part of his work of, of undoing the curse, reversing the curse. Now, this is why I say, I, I was trying to say, if you really know Jesus, we don't have any grounds for complaining. If you know Jesus and you know his word, you know what he's come to do. He's come to reverse all this. And, and not only that, if you belong to him, he has said all things work together for your good. So you're having a bad day at work. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's for your good. Go ahead, Bart. Mm -hmm. Right. Grab that whole context. There, the few verses right before. <laughs> Pause right there, just one second. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but bond servants. When you read that. Um, the best way for us to apply that to our day and time 
is really a blue collar worker would be like a bond servant in that culture. So this is this passage has a direct application to believers today for the relationships of employees and employers. Okay, go ahead. So whatever your job, whatever God's called you to do, you, you have to understand. If you've been bought by the blood of Jesus, Jesus is your boss. He's your employer. You're there on a charge for Him. You're there on an errand for Him. And this, what this does is we can begin to, we, we need to reinterpret our work. Uh, okay, yes, I need to make a living. Yes, I need health insurance. Yes, I have to buy groceries. But, but more important than all of that is I am serving Him. Um, there's a, if you wanted to get a set of glasses with two lenses and you could think about your work, um, you could think about your work through one lens, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, and through the other lens of loving your neighbor as yourself. And this way... You know, I, I, I'm not trying, I wouldn't be any great big hero that day when I was trying not to bleed on, I didn't want to bleed on the guy's um, floor because I knew then we would have to pay for it. <laughs> um, but um, when you now growing crops, growing cotton is first and foremost an act of love to God an act of serving God. And sec in second place, it's an act of love for others. I mean, what if there were no... <clears throat> Look at how many of y'all are wearing blue jeans this morning. I mean, you know, how many people have enjoyed wearing jeans? Um, or, our clothes are a blessing to people, you know? And so now this gives, this gives our, our work meaning. This gives our work incredible meaning. And um, so not only are you able, now I'm working for the Lord. Um, let's just say you don't like your job right now. Let's say I'm not really not ultimately happy. This doesn't feel like I'm where I'm meant to be. I feel like I can do more. I want to do more. You know, if, if you're just not happy because you're not getting as much pay as you like. Okay, all right, all right, seek to get more pay, but, but still, while you're there, you're working for the Lord. So the way you work ought to reflect that. Some of y'all have heard me tell the story before, but I used, to be, um, I used to be a deputy sheriff, and most of those years in Tiff County, I, I worked on the court security team. Job number one is protect the judge. Job number two is keep the whole courtroom, make it an environment of safety. Um, now, that's a pretty big deal. And so, like we would, we work death penalty cases. I was sitting feet away from a guy on death row being tried for murder, and they're going to try to, you know, have the death penalty. Well, that's kind of a big deal, and you're on heightened alert because y'all know in a trial or any time they bring him out in front of the jury, you know what they have to do with that person completely take every restraint off of him. You can't have him sitting in court in handcuffs because it makes him look guilty. So you're there the whole time. So we did some big things, and sometimes there were some important things. Sometimes there were great big medical cases where, but I guarantee you there were times when that judge would lean over to me and he'd say, yeah, Please go get my pen. I left it in the chambers. And buddy, when he asked me to do that, buddy, I jumped. I went. What? I was on an errand for somebody important. I was on an errand for a person of high dignity. I mean, a, a, an elected official is. And I'm not trying to overplay their importance, but you see my point. The, the simplest errand that Jesus sends you on is important, not because of how important you deem the work to be, but how important the dignity of the one who's using you to do that job. 
You see how this, if we start thinking about it this way, this gives our work incredible meaning. Right, right. I think I, I like to tie that to Romans twelve, chapter, uh, Romans chapter twelve, verses one and two. I appeal to you, but therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your spiritual worship. So our our, our daily life, our hour to hour, minute to minute, is a living sacrifice. Mm -hmm. How are we living? That's great. That's great. Um, a few implications of thinking about your work through the gospel. Number one, um, you don't, as men, we don't have to fall in the trap. N number one, we won't fall into the trap of seeing work as a necessary evil when we see the intent God has of giving us work as a blessing to us. And God, God is actually caring for his creation through the work of people. You know, if the trash people don't come, if the, if the trash people stop picking up folks' trash, people are going to die because of that. I mean, that's the germs, the, you know, the rats, the... I mean, that's a, that's a service. God's caring for humanity through the work of others, giving medical supplies, uh, carrying furniture to people, growing crops. These are ways God's caring for His creation. So... There's dignity in all work because God's caring for his creation through our work. But also there's dignity in work because if you're a believer, you're working for him. All right? Um, but also, we won't tr make the mistake of trying to find our identity through our work or through the size of our salary because we have a superior identity in Christ. We've been bought by the blood of Christ. What? Don't you know that you are not your own? You've been bought with a price. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Therefore, glorify God in your body. You, it, so in other words, if you're trying to seek your identity through um, a job, and I, I know Bart doesn't do this, and, and Bart, you tell me if I'm wrong, I wouldn't consider Bart a small-time farmer kind of medium size compared to some people who've got farming a lot more land than, than y'all are, right? Some people farming less. But, you know, I, there's got to be some farmers out here going, man, I, I'm farming 10,000 acres. <laughs> the next guy's only farming 1,000, you know, or I got this much for my crop this year and everybody, you know, and this compare and who's the, who's the best, who's the greatest, who makes the most money farming or, you know, we don't have to seek our identity in that. We have a superior identity in Christ. Yes. Um, another thing is, because we understand the gospel, we're not surprised by the effects of sin in the world. We're not surprised that we, we, we have imperfect systems that don't work well. Right, we, we're, not, we're not surprised by the thorns. We have the explanation for them. We know why they're there. And... I do think, um, you know, as ambassadors for Christ, He came to reverse the curse. He came to take the thorns to remove the thorn. That's ultimately where all this is going. And we view ourselves as agents of bringing in that new order, bringing in that restoration, and alleviating the effects of the curse in every way we can. Um, so and that takes away our grounds for complaining, right? Right? Um, last thing, I, I do want to talk, and we're kind of already into it, um, restoration. I don't know about y'all, I, I probably didn't have the greatest teaching on heaven growing up. Um, we know heaven's going to be this wonderful place when we die. 
everybody's going to be happy, be with Jesus forever. Um, and I think probably in the vacuum of, of good teaching, probably I would look at, I love Revelation 4 and 5. Like if you've read Revelation 4 and 5, these are majestic pictures of worship going on around the throne. So you might be tempted to think about heaven as just like eternally, like an eternal worship service that never ends. Or you might think about just, you just turn into, which is totally unbiblical, you just turn into a cute little cherub baby with wings floating on a cloud, you know. But you know, actually in the new heavens and the new earth in glory, there are signs that, biblical signs, that we will work. That there will be work, productive work, in the new heavens and the new earth. That, um, I'm going to show you a scripture to back that up here in just a second. But um, I, it's interesting. I heard someone say one time, you know, the Tower of Babel when God confused the languages and basically divided everybody up, and no, now everybody can't cooperate and bring their power together. And this guy was just making an observation that, man, we might have had commercial airliners, you know, within a few hundred years of that if God hadn't have done that. You know, if the fall hadn't come in, where, how much sooner might technology and good, healthy advancements come? But you know, God says, "Listen, I want you to. I want you to in, in the creation mandate. I want you to exercise authority over creation. Be be extensions of my dominion over creation. It's 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 very likely that in the new heavens and the new earth, that part of what we'll spend our time doing is extending the garden." throughout the universe. Now that's a little bit of imagination. But listen to this in Isaiah 65. And you hear the echoes of this in Revelation, at the end of Revelation. This is Isaiah 65, 17 through 23. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord and their descendants with them. You get a picture of the new heavens and the new earth. We're building houses, planting vineyards. No more thorns. Um, our labor will not be in vain. I mean, isn't that exciting? Isn't it exciting? Heaven's not going to be boring. We're going to be able to worship the Lord in every aspect of our existence um, like we've always been intended to. All right. I'm a little excited about that. I'll let you, I'll give you, a, is, that, is that interesting to think about? <laughs> You're not going to be a cute little baby floating on a cloud in heaven. That's not where the, all this is going. It's none, of, I don't, none of you would make very cute babies. <laughs> all right, anybody got anything else you'd like to say or close out with? Is this helpful? All right. We, as one, one of our ongoing things needs to be, we've been talking about accountability, is to help each other remember these things and stay accountable that this need, worship needs to be. Loving the, our work, our jobs, loving the Lord our God with all of our heart and loving our neighbors ourselves, encouraging each other to remember that, not be complainers. Um, be ambassadors of Christ. Um, on mission with him in his work of reversing the curse. All right. Scott, would you would you pray, brother?